When you were a kid, did you ever like make a toy where it's like two tin cans with a wire in between it and you talk into one end and the, the sound comes out the other end? Um, I mean, obviously if you did that, the sound coming out the other end wouldn't be the same as the sound going in. It gets kind of all folded on top of itself and kind of convoluted. I'd like to explain the formula for calculating the convolution and also go over some simple examples that will hopefully be a heuristic to help you understand the convolution theorem. So I'm gonna send a little impulse to this synthesizer and I send the impulse and as soon as the impulse stops, the sound stops. And now when I send an impulse, it persists, it lasts after I play the sound and then it slowly decays over time. That makes sense because the signal's kind of like all bouncing around inside the wire so we hear little echoes of the original impulse. This is the function that I'm imagining being the impulse response. I'm imagining our signal decaying as a negative exponential. After one second, this is the percentage of the original sound that you will hear. Now let's imagine that there was an impulse that happened. I'm using kind of like a really sharp bell curve shaped impulse. Suppose that we're trying to figure out how strong the signal would be at time x. This distance right here is the amount of time that has elapsed since this impulse happened. At time x, x minus t is the amount of time that has elapsed since the impulse at time t. f of t is the strength of the impulse at that time. g of x minus t is how much we need to scale down that impulse by the amount of time that has elapsed. Now let's try to figure out the strength of the signal assuming that there were two impulses. Figure out how strong the impulse was at time one, scaled down by the amount of time that has elapsed since time one, plus the strength of the signal at time two, scaled down by the amount of time that's elapsed since time two. The strength of the signal at time one, scaled down by the amount of time that's elapsed since time one, plus the strength of the signal at time two, scaled down by the amount of time that's elapsed since time two. Add up all of the impulses at time t, scaled down by the amount of time that has elapsed. Let's explore what happens when we calculate the convolution of functions that are oscillating with very similar frequencies. In the first example, I'm gonna calculate the convolution of a function that's oscillating at four hertz with a function that's oscillating at 3.5 hertz. Then I'm gonna move the frequencies a little closer together and calculate the convolution of a function that's oscillating at four hertz with a function that's oscillating at 3.75 hertz. What happens to this impulse right here? Well, at first, the wire is gonna dampen a lot of that impulse. And then later, the wire is going to allow a lot of that impulse to persist. And since these two frequencies are so close to each other, the time where the wire allows a lot of the impulse to persist lines up very close to the next impulse that's coming in from that signal. So the response from one impulse is going to constructively interfere with the next impulse coming in. In fact, if I move the two frequencies closer to each other, then I move the place where a lot of the signal persists even closer to the next impulse coming in. So the closer the two frequencies are to each other, the more constructive interference will happen. And we can really see that when we look at the graphs of these convolutions. The purple convolution comes from frequencies that are closer than the orange convolution and the magnitude of the purple convolution is much larger than uh, the magnitude of the orange convolution. So the closer that frequencies are, the larger that we should expect the magnitude to be. Observe that this is exactly how the product of two distributions will behave. So I have two distributions here, and then in purple, I am calculating the product of those two distributions. And this kind of purple graph over here is the magnitude of the product. Watch what happens as I slide these two distributions closer to each other. So 
the more that they overlap, the larger their product will be and also the larger the magnitude of their product will be, just like the convolution.